is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Today's episode is thanks to our Patreon members and our affiliates and partners. Head to patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition to join our membership or donate to the podcast and stay tuned to hear about some amazing deals and discounts from our partners, including Prevenix, Inside Tracker, Orgain, Practice Better, and Jen and Carrie. But for now, we're getting right to the show. Enjoy. Hey fans and listeners, Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez here, your host of the podcast. I'm here today with Ben Frederick, Executive Director of the Small Monsters Project. Among other things, Ben is a cyclist, cat dad, and mental health advocate. After his TBI in 2016, Ben struggled with depression and anxiety, which took root in an eating disorder that hospitalized him. His road to recovery and acceptance began when he was able to look his monsters in the face and learn to live with them. The first step was the scariest, but with the help of his friends, family, and professionals, Ben learned to live with his monsters, to walk alongside them, to have them in the open, not hidden away where they can grow and take hold. Ben, myself, and my podcast manager, Ruby, were so touched by your story. So there's a lot that we can talk about regarding nutrition, cycling, your injury, eating, just everything. But we also really wanted to highlight you, you know, as a man coming onto this podcast, a female athlete nutrition podcast, just to remember that you know, we're all human beings. And so much of, of what we're going to talk about today is just gender neutral and, and sex neutral. And just as human beings, there's so much that we can understand and relate and have compassion for. And so we're really excited to, you know, hear you speak on so many of these topics. So thanks again for, for being willing. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation. Yeah. And obviously, it's it's one that you're so comfortable with sharing now, which is why you have the the Small Monsters Project, which we'll we'll get into. But just to give our audience a little bit more of a background on on you, your your love for sport, specifically cycling. When did that start for you? Have you been an athlete your whole life? Kind of tell us a little bit about your sport journey and where it began. For sure, I um I had a little bit of an aptitude towards sport and like elementary middle school like I I had energy love to to play hard my mom was a runner and so I had you know this kind of like oh I could be you know somewhat identify as a runner even as early as elementary school and like was motivated to try to set you know school records in like the half mile or the mile or or anything like that but and like did that there was the the Hershey Hershey track and field competition in the summer. And so I was able I to kind of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so there, there was definitely some like, you know, interest and genetics at play. Yeah. And then going into, I guess, high school, I had a, a knee injury that kind of took me out of, out of athletics. And then I also really fell in love with music at the time. Mm. And so for the next, I guess, three or four years, just would would not have considered myself an athlete at all, just a big music nerd. And then my senior year of high school, I had gotten into the music school at James Madison University. And literally the last semester was just curious about running track again. And so I asked the coach, hey, could I, could I join late? I'd love to do a fast mile and make the four by eight A team. And I went from doing a, a 216, 800 with my first one that almost killed me. And by the end of the season was able to do like a 155. Wow. 
I'm sure the coach was bummed you didn't ask him that years earlier. <laughs> sure. And to an extent I was because, you know, I I didn't fully understand that, like, how good of a trajectory that was. But again, it just shows, like, thanks to mom and dad who mm. were athletic, but I wouldn't say athletes. Mm-hmm. Like, that was never part of, like, my... Like we didn't go athlete together as a family, yeah. but it just shows that showed that like the, that that was there. And so going into college, dove into music, but also was able to get a, a nice mountain bike with my graduation money wow. and just started ripping it around campus, like jumping downstairs and silly things, not like racing. And then twist of fate where I crashed, broke my hand. I was a bass major, so I couldn't continue my major but it was a blessing in disguise because I was able to get involved in outdoor adventure I became a trip leader for our adventure program at school and that introduced me to the world of like actually going out and mountain biking in the woods dabbling in some races and the combination of the skill aspect of being able to drive your bike well with the trying hard exercise part of mountain biking just really grabbed me. Mm -hmm. And so I went from my first race in like skate shoes and board shorts all the way into like full on spandex training. All the gear, all the things. (laughs) I I mean, as much as, you know, I could, I could uh, afford it. It took a while to like build a stable, but I, I sold like all my music equipment and started getting bikes and really wanted to naively as a, as like literally two years into it, go like, yeah, I think I could be a pro. Wow. And that just really kickstarted a journey where, yeah, the through line for the past 12 years has been bikes. But I definitely was not the kid who started when he was like 14 yeah, yeah. and was on the national team. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to like have it be my own starting when I was like 21. Yeah. So young in the sport, but started late. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so at what, so at what point, I think you already mentioned, like pretty early on, like within two years of diving into the sport, you kind of had it in your head of like, I want to be pro. I want to make, I want to make it to the highest level. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. And yeah, it, it was totally something where I got the bug. I wanted to absorb as much cycling as I could. So I like watched videos and web series. Those were just kind of starting up in the early, early, I guess like. 2010s and just like saw what those people were doing and I was like I want to do that yeah and so yeah I just went all in on on riding my bike and and again luckily because of my my genetics and my skill set and my passion for it like the improvement curve was exponential in the beginning Mm -hmm. where I just I did the thing I did well which gave me a positive feedback Mm -hmm. to want to do the thing more and the more I did the better I did and so it really kind of like the first few years, it was very Pavlovian. Like yeah. I did the thing and the bell rang and I got rewarded for it. Yeah. And so it was really easy to to kind of continue that. You know, I really do appreciate that you've, you've mentioned a couple of times now, kind of like the role that genetics play in this, you know, like this does not discredit all the work that you did put into it because you, you did. But like you said, it just kind of like there was in the beginning, at least there was that, that easy reward. And I appreciate your honesty in sharing that because I think, you know, the flip side is sometimes people put every ounce of effort that they have into something and don't get the reward that they think Mm. they're expecting. And this by no means says that we should limit ourselves based on our genetics. Go for your dream always, because you will really surprise yourself. But I think, I, I don't know. Sometimes I hear from people just that like, well, how did she, you know, get that result or how come they're, you know, winning or something like that, right? Like that comparison that we can have with other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not always coming down to just our, our work effort or time and training. You know, there's other factors that sometimes play a role and genetics is one of them that I think just giving a nod to that is, is good. That's not to say that obviously I didn't work hard exactly, (laughs) or that I, or that I don't look at my peers and get so frustrated because they're genetically at a better level than me. Like in, in the realm of, in the realm of, I guess, like bikes and where I, where I fit into it, like among, among the, I guess the category, or I guess my peers, I'm 
I'm actually pretty average (laughs) genetically. Okay. Yeah. There are people who can, you know, train less, train less focused, you know, have less focused nutrition, you know, could get four hours of sleep and still with one leg, kick my, kick my butt. Right. Right. (laughs) And so like, I just, you know, acknowledging that, uh, to what you just spoke on, yeah. you know, it's just acknowledging gen- genetics yeah. can yeah. just acknowledging it. I go through the same things of like jealousy of, you know, the potential of other people compared mm-hmm. to mine. Yeah. 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 And it's, you know, and we all have our, our strengths and, and weaknesses and things we can't control things we can't control. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I appreciate when it comes to training, like there's, you know, everybody's putting an effort, everybody wants to progress, but there's so many factors that go into it. So so for you, you know, like you said, early on, you you saw some good success, you know, like you said, your bell was ringing that made you work harder with more work, you got even better. So you moved up the ranks pretty quickly. And I don't know if there's anything more you want to share about that. But definitely, you know, the the story that you have been so graciously open about publicly now is kind of when things changed for you when there was a, an accident and a concussion. Mm-hmm. And so could you just share with our listeners who don't know your story more about the events that unfolded that really changed the direction of your life? Totally. I I had spent, I guess, three or four years racing at the professional level on the road, searching for that elusive contract. And I had gotten pretty close, but due, due to a few, uh, few circumstances, some injury, I had to kind of change from road cycling to what I was really, really passionate about in cyclocross, which is kind of a mix of road and mountain biking. Totally Google it. Uh, (laughs) There are some crazy videos, but it it really encapsulated all of the things that I loved about bikes, which was, you know, the exerciser component of being strong, but also the having to be able to drive your bike well. So you couldn't just like get away with pushing the most watts. And in cyclocross, I guess, compared to mountain biking, you're racing elbow to elbow with people Mm. instead of like kind of a time trial in the woods. And so, and, and the race was only an hour as opposed to these big long efforts. And so I really was like, okay, my, my skill set really values this. I I had gotten 12th at our national championships in 2015. And so 2016, all in cyclocross, I had gotten actually sponsorship for the first time and was really able to like, I guess, walk the walk. I, I moved to New England in Western Massachusetts, where there's this huge community of cyclocross athletes, so that I could, like, be a part of the top end of the sport instead of, like, traveling eight hours to race against these guys. I wanted to, like, be their friends and be a part of that community. Yeah. And then two weeks before the opening round of, of that year, I had a kind of a freak accident where, like, I compare it to, like, tripping over a linoleum floor. Like, there was no reason... <laughs> no reason I should have fallen doing what I was doing as a professional bike rider, but just had like a really freak accident and hit my head on the ground and, and suffered a concussion, which over the course of a few days really was exacerbated and, and turned into almost a two year recovery process where I went from hoping that I'd only take a few days off to a few weeks off to ended up not touching my bike for over a year. I had really bad symptoms where, you know, we can go more into like the actual concussion symptoms, but just really struggled to exist as a human where making breakfast was a struggle and had me need to rest until lunchtime so that I could have enough energy to make lunch. There was a lot of, there was a lot of different factors at play where I wasn't able to travel home to be with family because of my insurance in Massachusetts. I was still really new to the area, so I didn't have a support structure in place. And because I was essentially losing my identity and my career, I really struggled with both the situational reasons that I would be depressed, but also the chemical and physical changes to my brain yeah. that really brought on the depression and anxiety that kind of came with that whole change. And and so, yeah, that was definitely like a pivot point in my life where it went from like, you know, the the rug was kind of pulled out and you know, something that I had identified as, as part of my whole identity for a few years, three or four years, maybe even longer, I had Mm -hmm. to learn who my identity was as a human being as I built that from the ground up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, 
what you mentioned too, of not knowing that timeline, you know, some other injuries, although we, we should really be open with timelines, no matter what the injury, but sometimes we, you know, might, uh, if it's a bone injury, doctors might say, okay, boot for six weeks and then, you know, return to sport over the next six weeks or something like that. Right. Yeah. Like you can kind of get a little bit of some sort of timeline. And I think when it comes to brain injuries, from what I know about them, you know, it's, it's really difficult to know that timeline and have expectations. Like you said, you thought, oh, a couple of days off and then it ended up being so mm-hmm. much longer. I think that's really difficult to not have that timeline. And there's no boot that you can put on yeah. or crutches that you can use that kind of validates visually what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And I, I do want to caveat saying like my, I, I was experiencing or I had post concussive syndrome. So not to like freak out our listeners, the, the, the right now that the, the science is showing that like the median time to a return to sport for a concussion, they, they did a study with over like 3000 NCAA athletes is like 28 days, which in the, in the scope of a season is like, that's like the whole season. Yeah. But in the, in the scope of like, you know, a whole life, which, you know, if you're able to zoom out and be objective is like not that long. So again, my, my experience had a lot of confounding factors that led to the post-concussive syndrome that had a, a longer recovery timeline. Could you clarify? Sorry, I guess I'm just not, I've never heard that term before. Yeah. The post-concussive syndrome. Could you just kind of clarify what that is? Sure. Concussion symptoms can include, but not are, but are not limited to headache, fatigue, nausea, balance problems, vestibular problems. So like eye tracking and movement. Mm-hmm. And again, those can, those can usually subside within a week, two weeks, mm-hmm. a month, but longer than two months, you get medically, you get, you get described as having post-concussive okay. syndrome. So it's just concussion symptoms yeah. that last longer Lasting than longer a than month or two. The usual, what is considered, yes. yeah, normal. Mm-hmm. Hey fans, I hope you are enjoying this conversation so far and we'll be back to it in just a moment. But first, I want to pause and let you know that this episode is brought to you by the Female Athlete System of Transformation, aka a fast track to overcome disordered eating and use food as fuel to perform at your highest level. The Female Athlete System of Transformation is my unique program and proven systems to guide female athletes to understanding and implementing the proper nutrition for their sport, life, and health. Myself and my team of registered sports dietitians work one-on-one with clients to address their unique needs and counsel them through the nutritional and behavioral changes needed. Many female athletes who resonate with disordered eating, mental guilt around food and body, relative energy deficiency in sport or female athlete triad, amenorrhea, repeat injuries due to negligent nutrition, or frankly, just a lack of knowledge and understanding on their fueling needs have seen incredible success in the fast track. After years of working as a sports RD, I've compiled the most effective ways for female athletes to learn nutrition, be supported, be challenged, and ultimately find their success with fueling as fast as possible. So don't wait another day. Get to your goals faster by joining the Female Athlete System of Transformation. Look in the show notes or head to the website to book a free call and learn more. Okay, now let's get you back to the conversation. Enjoy. Okay. Yeah. So, so this for you, like this was, I I don't know the percentage of people who have that, but uh, maybe a little more abnormal for this to go on quite so long. Yes. Between five and 8% if we're going to get specific. Okay. Oh, great. You know, I'm like, I don't know. You know, that's why we have you on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I think, like you said too, there were a lot of factors of not being near family, having just moved to a new area. So you, you know, didn't really have a strong support system at that time. So this was a lot to deal with emotionally, physically, because having a concussion, like you said, it it took a physical, it takes a physical toll. You might not see it like wearing a cast, but sometimes just that energy to you to get out of bed, you didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And, and then we're dealing with this unknown of our timeline or unknown of the future and this loss of your identity of your job, of your purpose, of what brought you joy. I think anybody listening can totally understand 
why this was a dark and difficult time for you. I'm getting like emotional. I'm getting really emotional right now. So at what point, I guess, because you were in a place and a time in your life where maybe the best of friends or those who love you most just weren't physically near you or couldn't be, you know, who who or what kind of brought it to your attention that, you know, more help is needed or I'm not in a good place to start seeking more help? Was there any sort of light bulb? And and maybe we can get into the nutrition side of things if that was the light bulb that really spiraled, you know, and again, another change in direction. Mm -hmm. I think, let's see. I mean, I, I, I have like an, a friend slash like adopted mom, Jalyn, who like we would, she'd be like, like we, we'd talk on the phone every day for as long as I needed. Yeah. So having that touchstone is really important. And then while I was still trying to figure things out and, you know, I had cultivated this Ben Frederick brand. And so I wanted to keep people involved. And I was posting to Facebook, yeah. some local cyclists in that area just reached out. We're like, Hey, this could be any one of us. So like, let, let me know how I can help. Like, oh, I love that. Let me bring you groceries. Power of community. Yeah. Mm. And so mm-hmm. that that really kickstarted this amazing, amazing network of friends who are who are family now that I can go back to Massachusetts and and just have a home. And without like to the point like I wasn't able to drive yeah. for almost two years. And so they would they organized like a phone tree so that when I had appointments in Boston, which was like two hours away, like, all right, you know, it's, it's Cole's turn to take an afternoon off work to drive me to Boston. It's, you know, Megan's turn, who's going to come and just sit with me for 15 minutes. So I saw a human today. Yeah. And so really building that support structure and, and getting that validation of like, an ability to share my experience with people who didn't understand. Yeah. Like I, I didn't understand. And I was figuring it out as I went. And just, you know, the quick aside is that's a lot of where Small Monsters Project is the work we're doing is to not have this like figuring it out yourself. Because you're in a, you're in a place where you can't figure it out yourself. You know, you really need that help. And, and I I appreciate you bringing all of this to the table because yeah, I, I had a college teammate who got a concussion during season one time. And I really didn't understand concussions at that time. Mm -hmm. I really didn't. So I don't think I offered her the help and support that she needed, you know? So I think hearing this story and, and what you're going through is like, okay, so if this happens to somebody, you know, whether you're a close friend or just a coworker, like offering that help is so needed. It's your brain. It's your brain. Yeah. You know, it is. It's, it's so vital to who you are. And like, you can't like, like I said, you can't just like put, put a boot on your leg and then put it up and then still operate normally. Yeah. Um, there it's, it's a fight for normalcy, but knowing that there could be a new normal. Yeah. So all of that, like, again, I I do want to emphasize, you know, at this moment that my experience is very, is my own. Yes. And I'm not saying that like, if you have a concussion or if you struggle with eating, like this is the path. Right. There are a lot of similar similarities along, along this thing. So I just really want to like point that out and, you know, honor everyone else's experience for what they're going through. And so all that to say that, you know, my, my story is very intertwined and it's really hard to be reductionist with Mm -hmm. different parts of it. And so like, you know, as we talk about the nutrition part of this, being an athlete, you know, the, I wasn't helping myself because of kind of the, the culture around athletics and cycling that I was, you know, tangential to like I really tried to push against the you know the offhanded comments that we as cyclists can make sometimes about like being fat or like eating too much or you know you know like we're in the top like half of percent of like athletics here like we're we shouldn't be you know so focused on this and there was a there was a cyclist named is a cyclist Peter Sagan and he said something that was really, really amazing back in like, I guess, 2014, 2015, which in that time was so poignant where they, Peter, you've won all these races, you're three-time world champion. Like, you know, how much do you weigh? How much do you weigh? And he's like, "Uh, I do not know. I weigh forever how much to go this fast. He's 
Slovakian. Yeah. And so, and that was such a poignant, like he's, he was a big, like muscular guy. Yeah. Just kicking all these, you know, really lean, skinny guys, butts, and it was like, so like light bulb moment. Right. Like how he's, he looks and eats however much he needs to be as strong as he is. Yeah. So that was that was kind of the core that I really tried to hold on to. But then when I lost lost the ability to be an athlete, lost that kind of structure of nutrition. Mm-hmm. Like I was really good at eating to fuel my body to be, you know, an athlete who trains twenty to thirty hours a week. Losing that and basically living in a dark room for twenty hours a day. Yeah. I I didn't have the skills or the, yeah, I just didn't have the skills to know how to fuel just existence. And then, you know, that coupled with the culture in athletics of like, don't get fat, like don't gain a ton of weight. And just the desire, like I had no control in my life. And then there's this one thing that I have to do three times a day that I can control, kind of like set the foundation for, you know, the the eating disorder, disordered eating to, to really, that monster started to get bigger and bigger took life and hidden in the background. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a maladaptive coping mechanism to the whole experience that I was living. I really appreciate that. You just said a maladaptive coping mechanism because so, so many people say like, Oh, it became my coping mechanism. It's like, it's not, it's not really a, a efficient or a successful coping mechanism. So maladaptive is nope. the exact Perfect phrase. I'm going to start using that moving forward. But there's kind of like two different things that you brought up here. First is is that culture in the sport of cycling, which is in many sports, of the the fear of fat, the fear of weight, the fear of overeating, and the obsession with being a certain look, weight, leanness, body composition. I mean, that in and of itself and the culture within each sport can be slightly different, but the pressures that you feel. And so that was certainly present in your sport prior to all of this happening, which was not a good thing. But maybe as somebody who was, you know, doing well in life and doing well in your sport, it didn't turn into anything negative for you, though it was still just like, "Hmm," you know, like, this is the culture and it's annoying. And, you know, when other people had different perspectives, that was really helpful, right? But then it's, oh, when my sport is taken away from me, that, okay, I was okay eating when I was training as an athlete, now eating those fears and monsters, as you call them, really become a lot bigger and come Mm -hmm. to life a lot more. So as you expressed, you did start really controlling as a maladaptive coping mechanism, controlling your, your food intake. And I think we can all understand and assume that that wasn't a good thing to do physically or mentally. As we said, the coping mechanism mentally wasn't, didn't actually work in the end because it probably became our new, well, you can tell me, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but how it probably added, ended up adding more stress or more negative emotion to your life as well. What for you were, actually I did hear you, you've spoken about this before and I heard you say this perfectly before that I want to share that, you know, people did start to bring to your attention. Hey, Ben, you know, kind of worried about your weight, worried about your nutrition, worried about your health, worried about you. And your initial reaction, a defense mechanism was, you know, no, I'm fine. You know, if this was a problem, then, you know, I'd be in the hospital. Or if this was a problem, then I wouldn't be able to, you know, to, you know, walk up the stairs without a problem, whatever it might be. So there was a lot of that denial because maybe, in your your eyes were not open to how this was negatively affecting you where other people were noticing it first. Is that correct? For sure. I mean, you know, from a, just a super like scientific standpoint, like I wasn't, and th- this, it wasn't like, it wasn't like I decided, you know, I'm, I don't want to like, uh, it's, it's all very connected That's, and, yeah. and not, not reductionist, but you know, the fear of gaining weight was, that was the like the initial like excuse yeah. or or motivating factor it wasn't about losing weight no it wasn't about like trying to be smaller in in the beginning and it wasn't like it was it was a decision it 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 was a there was a lot of gray yeah. between between when it started and then where i ended up and so just highlighting that too it was it was like 
yeah, someone turned on the heat in a big pot of water. And over the course of a few years, it it went to boiling. I didn't jump in. the So right. just caveating that. I also had this big brain injury yeah. that was like the focus that was taking away from, you know, this insidious thing that was slowly eating away at me in the background. And, you know, over the course of, of the two years, you know, it was, there was, you know, body dysmorphia that came in. Like I, I truly couldn't see myself objectively anymore. There was, you know, I guess like there was a certain point where it was like, I am suffering so much with this, with what is happening in my life, whether it's brain injury, whether it's like not having a sense of direction, whether it was, you know, losing my career not knowing what was next, not having skills or a direction where like I was suffering and it, I wanted, you know, in a really twisted way, like I wanted to look like I was suffering. Mm. Also, there was just like, and again, this is just caveating this, like this is my experience and don't, don't wait till you're in boiling water to seek help. Yeah. But, you know, it was, it was like something that in a twisted way, like I had worked hard at to feed the monster. And so it was like an investment that I wanted to continue continue again it's it's hard to describe even being removed from well, it and and that's the whole reason you know we want to we do call it a disorder an eating disorder a body yeah. dysmorphia disorder because it, it is twisted mm-hmm. it doesn't when you're in a, a a good place a better place you know it it's like oh my gosh that's so messed up of course but when you're in it yeah totally totally you're in it you don't you you know you're you don't see it that way. And so, yeah, I, I, I mean, I totally understand. I think most of our listeners will understand if they don't, you're mm-hmm. teaching them right now of how it, and that's how it, that's how it gets to that boiling water. Like you said, it's not always yeah. at one point in time. It's not a decision. It's just like, it keeps kind of getting twisted along the way. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of context and fast forwarding, but I reached a point where it was, I was very actively living in denial. Like I, I'm like, I'm not looking, like if I acknowledge that I have an eating disorder, then I have to own that. So I'm just not going to acknowledge, <laughs> acknowledge, like the thing is like right here. Mm-hmm. I don't have that. Cause if, if I say that I do, then I have to deal with it. Yeah. But then I reached a point where it just controlled my whole life. And, and this, even the, the small steps that I had been able to make to try to be a human in society, I, I had gotten an opportunity to work for a cycling clothing brand that, you know, as an, an ex pro brain injured, didn't finish school athlete to have an opportunity with this brand. It was a huge opportunity, but it, I was not able to do the job or even exist as a functioning human and was starting to have some like medical issues and just an overwhelming, overwhelming, I guess, pressure from friends to like, you got to do something. Yeah. And so I kind of hit a breaking point and, you know, it was like, I guess my bottom was realizing that more than a small part of me was resigned to whatever happened, Mm -hmm. knowing, knowing that, knowing the outcome, if I continued down the path, which was to not live anymore, I was like being resigned to that really kind of shocked me because that was, I knew at at the core of who I am that that that's not truth to me, and so that's when I back to my you know friend adopted mom Jalyn. I was just like, I need, I can't, I can't be the one to do this. I don't have the power to do this, but like, make the appointment, call the person, whatever. I'll I'll do whatever it takes, but I can't make that for like my my first step was giving someone else permission to yes. do that. Yeah. And then, yeah, and that started, that started around a, I guess, a six month, pretty intensive treatment program where we really kind of realized the, the toll that it had taken on my body and, and just the amount of time that it was going to take to, to be healthy again, both from a physical human being standpoint, but, you know, give, give myself mental skills and tools and mm-hmm. all the things to, to kind of come out of that. Thanks to Inside Tracker, I can get insights and feedback on my blood biomarkers whenever I want to. No more waiting for doctor's visits and them telling you, you're fine. 
Instead, you are in control of your health with Inside Tracker. For 20% off any of their products, blood biomarker testing, DNA kit, inner age, head to InsideTracker.com and use the code RISEUP. Take your health into your own hands. Health, wellness, and fitness coaches, listen up. Practice Better is the all-in-one platform that I use to manage my business and my clients. From client scheduling and messaging, hosting sessions, taking notes, creating modules, invoicing, telehealth, building reports, and more, Practice Better is the better way to manage your practice as a nutrition or health or fitness coach. Look no further. Use the link in our show notes and use the code Rise up 20 for 20% off your first four months plus a 14 day free trial. I've been using Practice Better since the inception of my business, Rise Up Nutrition, and I couldn't be happier. Again, the code is Rise Up 20, all caps. Use the link in our show notes for 20% off your first four months and a 14 day free trial. Let's get back to the episode. Yeah. So, so you entered a, an inpatient treatment program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think, um, what you are highlighting in this conversation, like kind of coming through your words too, is yeah, a treatment program was sure for the, the physical manifestations of an eating disorder, but I think more importantly, really overcome, like conquering those monsters, addressing those monsters, addressing the eating disorder that you didn't even want to acknowledge existed, learning how to give power to somebody else or something else instead of keeping it all yourself. So this was, you know, really, I'm losing my words here, but the, so often we think eating disorders, we're thinking nutrition, we're thinking medical health, physical health. That's there, of course, but this was for sure a journey of, of your emotional and mental health Mm -hmm. to address address the problem, address the fears, address the monsters and unravel that whole situation. Totally. And, you know, there was a lot of shame associated, both being a male who, you know, it's, you know, eating disorders exist in the male, male existence, and it's not really talked about. And so there was shame in that. And in, you know, in most of the programs that I participated in, I was one of, you know, I was the only male. The man. Yes. Yeah. Or there'd be a very, very, very small percentage. And so, you know, not having a ton of people to relate to, but also learning the language of recovery and learning the language of mental health. It, you know, like you said in, in the beginning, it, it, you know, it crosses genders, sexes, life experience, athletics, just it's, it's, you know, there's not one person that like fits this mold. It can really affect anyone. And so again, I was, I was so fortunate to have it's, I went through the Walden behavioral care facility in, in Massachusetts and, and they have, they had a full like return to life stepping down program where I spent, you know, my first night in the ER and then stepped down to a inpatient. And then they had like a partial program that was still medically monitored, but we had the opportunity to like learn how to cook for ourselves again. And then that was, then there was a step down to like, like kind of a day program where you go during like work hours, but then you get to go, go home and practice these skills. Mm -hmm. And then for like the the next year, it was like, I would go to two times a week programming more just to like, keep looking at these monsters so that they are small and I can live with them. And so I, I will highlight again, you do not need to be at the point where the water is boiling and you need these resources to seek the resources yeah the the soon i mean what would you tell yourself <laughs> now like yeah. just listen to your friends listen to listen to the, i'm i'm sure there's a part of yourself that recognizes that this is incongruous to you know a healthy existence so like really listen to that and pay attention to that yeah and the sooner you do you know, not only are we going to prevent the bigger problems from happening, but it's a, it's a more true voice you're listening to. Cause I think, you know, like you said, it, it, the further along this journey you get, it's hard to find your true voice because the monster's voices are even louder, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's Mm -hmm. uh, the sooner you start listening to your own voice, the the better off you're going to be And it. This Walden facility sounds like a wonderful facility with all those step down programming, because I know that's a, a huge, you know, issue is some people do get that 
help and support immediately, but then they, they go home, they don't know what to do. And so I'd love to hear that you kind of followed it all the way through. You didn't just do this, you know, inpatient, like three month thing. And then, okay, I'm, I'm home now and going to tackle it on my own. Or, you know, I don't know exactly how everything that went on in your head, but the, the knowing that, you know, what's the next step to help, help me deal with this, recover from this and resume my, my sense of self and normalcy and health and life back. You need those step down programs. So, mm-hmm. and I was, and I was fortunate enough to like really see that, yeah, that bottom that I had gotten to, and use all of my like determination as an athlete and perseverance, and like really focus it into like, well, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna do it, damn it, I'm gonna like really do. It. I'm gonna see this like, this is such a horrible, horrible thing to have to go through. Both the like, you know, leading up to going to recovery, and then just being, you know, being in that, in that, like, that's just not a place that I wanted to go back to or exist in any longer than I had to. Mm -hmm. And so it's definitely a commitment to like, these places exist to help people. And if they didn't help people, then they probably wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. So just a full begrudging buy-in, but it was a buy-in. Full commitment to it. And, and and it, I mean, I was able to go out the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. We are so glad you did. And I, I want to shift now because of this huge life experience of yours. That is why the Small Monsters Project now exists. And I'd love if you could share with our listeners a bit more about that and its mission. Yeah. So the, what we what we put on the tin is that our mission is to provide education and resources around concussion and TBI, while also helping to reduce the stigma around mental health challenges. So that's like the you know the elevator pitch mission, but it's really to try to give give a community a a way to hear that they're not alone, to help the next, you know, me who who got a concussion and and didn't I didn't know where to look. My caretakers didn't know where to look because that was really, you know, the thing that kind of set a lot of things in motion. And then just trying to voice that like, you know, the adage that it's okay to not be okay. Like so in all of this, like my monsters didn't go away. They still exist. Based on my experience and based on, you know, other people that are that are in this space, you know, I don't think that the, the the monsters just disappear or that you can conquer them. I think that they can be quiet, but without addressing them and kind of like acknowledging that they exist, they're just they're just back in that closet doing push ups, getting ready for when you're least expecting them. Mm-hmm. And so so when I was able to take my big monsters into the light and learn to address them and learn to deal with them. They became a lot smaller and, and something that like, not that I'm proud to have them live on my sleeve every day, right. but it's just, if I don't, I know what's going to happen. Yeah. And, and so we, you know, a lot of the the imagery that we use is like really cute little monsters. Yeah. That's what I'm imagining too. Like, the, and I'm smiling, but it's just such good imagery because I'm like imagining, like you said, the monster in the closet doing push ups when you're not addressing it versus pull them out. I'm like, oh, it's like your little pet. You can take care of them. You can keep them at bay. You've got to train, train them, put a little leash on him, <laughs> you know, and, exactly. I've, and I've been on the website. So I've seen the imagery and I've got this great, you know, picture like that, that visual image. And I think that's such a wonderful way to uh, address these things. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, if we're going to compare it to like, you know, I know there's a lot of athletic athlete people who, who listen to this. So like, let's say, soccer player and you tear your MCL and you go through all the surgery, whatever recovered. But if you don't continue to do the PT, your, your knee could hurt. And so if like you spend, you know, say you, you you do your activations every single day, that takes like five minutes and you're fine. Mm -hmm. You can operate completely normally. But if you like skip on it during off season or for like two months, you might have issues again Mm -hmm. and then have to like, freaking address it and spend a lot of time and focus to get it back to the point where if you just did your five minutes a day, no big deal. So it's kind of, that's, same that's kind of the same thing. And I think that's, that's a great reminder for us to address our mental health, our mental injuries in a very similar way that we would our physical injuries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the small monsters project is, is there to advocate for mental health, to provide education and resources for mental health, including and surrounding concussion and TBI as well. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. And so what we're doing right now is I'm, I'm on the road racing part of the US CX cyclocross calendar. And so it's, you know, it's a thing that I sport that I love and something that I really want to do well at, at a personal level. But it's also, you know, a lot of the eyes of sport are here. And it's just my, my, my people, my community. And so we're out at all of the races doing clinics and, and talking about resources. And again, just using, using that little spotlight to, to acknowledge what we're doing and, Mm -hmm. and have, have someone in the sport talking about the monsters that they've, they've faced. Mm -hmm. And then in 2024, looking ahead, we're, we're looking to do more of a speaking series that, that goes beyond just cycling high school collegiate athletics is, is very important and, you know, setting a good foundation there can, you know, hopefully change people's lives. And then, and then we're also looking to do media and video visuals so that, you know, if someone needs to hit Google to try to find community or support or a voice like theirs that they can find it. And so, so any, you know, any donations are going to go to those things right now. We also, if you or your friends are a cyclist, we have actually a small monsters project jersey where you can literally wear your monsters on your sleeve <laughs> and, and hopefully it can be a nice conversation starter. And so there's a link to that on the website. And, and yeah, that, those are the, those are the main, main ways that we're, we're, you know, looking to get funding, but you know, we're always, always looking for partnerships, yeah. you know, the right now, it's really easy for me to talk about concussion and, and TBI because that's that's where a lot of my partner's focuses are yeah. right now. But there's, man, the whole world of mental health exists. And so, you know, if there's partnerships or, or people who are interested in, in helping elevate the message that we're trying to share, yeah. like, please, please reach out. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's a great, you know, final message is if, if you need the support and resources, reach out to the Small Monsters Project if you are, agree that this is a wonderful mission, want to partner, want to support, you know, to consider that donation, consider reaching out and see what can be done to keep spreading this mission. is a wonderful and much needed mission. It is. Ben, I think I could probably keep talking to you. I feel this way with all of my guests about <laughs> so much, but we've, we've had a, a really full conversation here. So we'll bring it to a close. And, and I always say we can always invite you back for another future episode. But I end every episode with the same questions for all of my guests. Cool. You ready to play along quickly? Let's do it. Okay. Ben, if there's one food you could eat every single day for the rest of your life and never get sick of it, what would it be? <laughs> um the the specific combo of white like it's i think they're like japanese sweet potatoes yeah with tahini on them Ooh. like so roasted with tahini is like one of my favorite favorite thing yeah that sounds great wow i love that answer seems obvious but i have to ask what is your favorite sport to participate in actually uh surfing yes a curveball wow curveball <laughs> I, I've just recently moved to San Francisco like a year ago, and I'm looking forward to when I have more space in my life to continue to learn surfing. Like I, I yeah. did it a bunch in high school, but being able to approach it from an athlete mind, but also just in this really fun, uncontrolled environment that also has creativity involved and yeah. and not being very good at it yet. It just really, it really lights me up right now. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of challenge of, yeah, Mm -hmm. every day when you show up, you get to challenge yourself or, you know, see your little improvements and that, that it is, it is a good feeling. Well, the improvements, the improvements in surfing right now are huge because it's that beginner. Yeah. Whereas like, I'm just (laughs) in cycling right now, I'm just trying to not get worse as I (laughs) age. (laughs) Yep. So I can, I can understand why surfing is your new favorite sport to participate in. Love it. And how about as a spectator, what's your favorite sport to watch and cheer on? Cycling for sure. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of, of the sport. I'm going to ask you two questions. I usually only ask one more question, but I'm going to ask you two. So my usual question, Ben, if there's a female athlete out there that you think is really inspiring or is a role model for any reason in your personal life or more well-known, who would that be and why? Um, probably Kate Courtney. She's just total badass and, and an advocate for the mental game for, you know, fueling for strength Mm -hmm. for, you know, just, you know, the hustle that it takes. I mean, she's, yeah, definitely been part of my, uh, 
of the people that I look to as, as how I want to present both as an athlete and what I aspire to be as an athlete. Amazing. So to Kate Courtney, wonderful. And then, you know, for our other male guests that we've had on this podcast, I've never asked them this question, but I think you really highlighted to me, you know, when you were going through your struggles, how actually you didn't have, you know, another man kind of going through this with you. You felt like you were the only one. And so I think to know for any guy listening to this, you know, that we care about you feeling <laughs> and being not alone in this as well. So Ben, if there's a male athlete out there that you want to give a shout out to for being inspiring and a role model for any reason whatsoever, who would that be and why? Just recently, actually, there's a, a mountain trail runner named Tim Olaf, Olafson who just released a documentary called What Goes Unsaid. Yes. And it, it really highlights his his struggles with body dysmorphia and disordered eating and you know, with, with these kind of struggles, you know, you know, not everyone, like, it wasn't like, you know, beat for beat my story, right. but there was a lot of through lines and validated a lot of things that I went through. Yeah. And again, that's, that's ungendered. Right. It is. But it was, it was really, really empowering to see him, him step up and, and kind of talk about that stuff. I need to watch that. I'm familiar with him as an athlete and I heard about that documentary coming out. So I'll, I'll need to watch it. And and yes, just like you said, this is ungendered, but it's so nice to know, oh, here's somebody who looks like me. Here's how somebody, you know, whatever it might be. And so, you know, I think for any any guy that comes across this podcast, you know, reach out to Ben and his resources, you know, r- watch that documentary of Tim and and reach out to the small monsters project. So the small monsters project.com, social media at the small monsters project and at Benjam Benjam Fred, right? Or Ben Jam Fred. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Ben, thank you so much once again. This was an awesome conversation. Just so nice to meet you. Yes, this is great. Thank you all for listening. Well, everybody, thanks for listening. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did, if you are a true fan of female athlete nutrition, then I would love if you could support our podcast by spreading the word, share a review on your listening channel, give us five stars. It really helps get the word out and get the show more views to positively impact others. Also, you can support the podcast by joining our Patreon Head to patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition to consider a donation or even better, join our membership where you get extra monthly content and perks. We don't want you to simply listen alone. We want you to be a part of a community and a movement of fierce, fit, and fueled female athletes. So patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition is where you can do exactly that, learn more, and join. A huge thanks to our affiliates and partners as well. Once again, Prevenix, Inside Tracker, or Gain, Practice Better, Jen and Carrie. Please go check them out and their links in the show notes where you can get deals and discounts. Last, be sure that you do more than just listen. If you need help with fueling, it's time to take action. Head to my website to learn more. You can either book a free call with me to learn more about our coaching programs and how we can work directly with you, whether it's the fast track or otherwise. Or you can take our online self-study course, Female Athlete Nutrition. You can literally sign up and gain access right now. You can explore our downloadable products, including the Red S Recovery Guide, High Iron Fueling Guide, Or if you are a coach of a team, check out our brand new coaches toolkit for teams. You can also just learn more. We have a blog, a Red S quiz to see if Red S is affecting you. If you need help, I want you to get help fast. Too many girls and athletes struggle with nutrition, but you don't have to any longer. You can rise up with the power of nutrition, take action today in any of these avenues, and become fierce, fit, and fueled. Links in the show notes, and we'll see you next time.